It's difficult to treat eosinophilic esophagitis with steroids because there's a lack of formulation specifically tailored to the disease. So we're left using formulations intended for other diseases. And in this video, we're gonna tell you how to successfully do that, including how to make a budesonide slurry. The two commonly used steroids to treat eosinophilic esophagitis are borrowed from medications that are typically used in inhalers, and those are fluticasone and budesonide. Fluticasone may be even better known as the over-the-counter spray for seasonal allergies, and budesonide is a great medication to use in the GI tract because it's rapidly broken down by the liver, which leaves it inactive within the body, and therefore there's few in the way of systemic side effects. Both of these are also used as topical steroids, and they contrast prednisone that you take as a pill, and that neither of them will have much in the way of systemic side effects, which is a good thing if you end up taking this for the long haul for eosinophilic esophagitis. But with both, a concern remains that you're gonna have steroids in your esophagus, which means you can get related infections within your esophagus. Commonly, people will get candida esophagitis, and that can actually occur in up to 20% of people taking the therapy long-term. If you have a history of herpes, then we will rarely see people develop herpes esophagitis, but overall, this is very uncommon. Fluticasone and budesonide have both shown success within clinical trials with about 7 in 10 patients enjoying benefit. And so ultimately, the best choice is the one that you feel works best for you. Though once you select one, the dosing is not too readily interchangeable, so you're going to need to stick with it. If you've tried one and you didn't feel like it worked, you might try the other, although I may just as soon recommend that you would consider an elimination diet that we talk about elsewhere, or one of the new targeted therapies that directly address eosinophils. Now, it's worth noting that neither fluticasone or budesonide have been FDA approved for the use in eosinophilic esophagitis. So what's that mean? Well, I as a doctor can read medical literature and know that from the experience of my colleagues that this has been very successful. I was trained doing it, and so I'm confident in the therapy. However, a drug company has to be FDA approved in order to market and sell a drug for a specific purpose. And so there's no existing eosinophilic esophagitis steroid, which means we have to use formulations from previously FDA approved purposes, like inhalers, and repurpose them to be used in the esophagus. There are trials underway to gain approval from the FDA for specifically tailored medications that will work very well within the esophagus, that is still going to take time, and as it is a lot of money, which means that ultimately those formulations, should they be approved, will be very expensive. A fluticasone inhaler is available for treatment of COPD and asthma in a 220 microgram inhaler, and that's been studied for eosinophilic esophagitis in a dose of two to four sprays, which amounts to 440 to 880 micrograms taken twice a day. Now that seems to contrast what I just said, that there haven't been sufficient clinical trials to gain FDA approval. These studies have been performed at academic centers with faculty who are interested in the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis, and they've helped to inform other physicians that this is an effective way to repurpose the medicine and that it's worked very well for these patients. However, because this was done in a single academic center, it's a relatively small number of patients not a sufficient amount of data for a drug company to take and present to the FDA. So that's why it remains not FDA approved. So in the case of eosinophilic esophagitis, rather than using this as an inhaler, the patient is using it as a spray, which they then swallow. In order to prevent it from getting overly aerosolized, you don't want to use a spacer that would be used when you're delivering it into the lung. And like Bill Clinton, you don't want to inhale. No, really, you don't want to inhale. Hold your breath while you're taking it and swallow it down. Budesonide has several formulations, and we use it for other therapies in the GI tract, but it's proven that the most effective one for eosinophilic esophagitis is an ampule, which is originally intended to be used in an inhaler. It has a little bit of liquid in it that is burst and aerosolized on dosing, and instead you just break that open and drop the liquid and mix it up with some sweetener. Now that's done for two reasons. One is to increase the volume and thicken it up, but it's also because the stuff don't taste particularly good. Now there is some variation in how you mix up this slurry. So I went back to the trial that demonstrated its effectiveness and looked at what they described doing. They used an ampule that contains about two milliliters of medication and they mixed it with 10 one gram packets of sweetener. They used Splenda. That resulted in a total of eight milliliters. Now I've seen other authoritative sources suggest that you can only use five. 
I would say just go ahead and use 10. And the reason is, is that by getting a nice, thick, sweet volume of eight milliliters, you have a sufficient amount to nicely coat the whole length of your esophagus. I think that's gonna result in a better quality of the therapy. Some people may prefer to not use a sweetener, in which case they can use an alternative like maple syrup, honey, or perhaps some applesauce. And in that case, I would say use about a teaspoon, so about five milliliters with the addition of the two milliliters, and you get a nice seven millimeter mix, still in the same general amount of volume that the original trial described. Now this is certainly inconvenient, but I see no reason that you shouldn't be able to mix up several doses to give you some for several days. You just break open a few ampules and keep the same ratio of ampule to sweetener. Now, just like natural peanut butter tends to settle and you have to mix it up to make a good PB and J, you need to make sure that you're mixing up your budesonide slurry before each dose so that you have a consistent ratio across each dose day to day. For both fluticasone and budesonide, it's important that you not eat or drink anything for 30 minutes after. That's to prevent a dilution and clearance of the medication from the esophagus. And in that same vein, I imagine it'd be helpful to use a spittoon so you don't have your saliva diluting out the medication, but I've not found a study that specifically explores that question. Careful oral hygiene after taking a dose is an important step to prevent thrush, a fungus growing on your tongue, which could also seed an infection deeper into your esophagus. Patients often appreciate improvement of their symptoms within one week of therapy. After two months, any benefit that would be expected has probably already been achieved, and at this junction, you can start to decrease the dose, a process that is gradually done, often over the course of another two months, but is tailored to each individual patient. Relapse is not uncommon, and so you may not be able to taper your medication all the way to nothing, but if you could reduce the dose by half, that would be great. Relapses often coincide with seasonal allergies, and so if you know the timing of these, it can be an opportunity to get ahead of the problem and increase the dose in the weeks ahead of your typical seasonal flares. It's informative to get endoscopies along the way at the completion of the initial therapy to see that in fact you have gotten all the eosinophils out of your esophagus and at key junctions like if you're having a flare. That's often because what you need is a dilation of the esophagus to help stretch out and break any scar tissue. It's important to remember that steroids will help reduce the inflammation of the disease, but they really do nothing to break down the scar. I hope this information has helped those of you with eosinophilic esophagitis better understand how you can use steroids to combat the disease. Thank you for watching and be safe.